First, let me introduce for those of you who are not from the fusion circles or the magnetic fusion, what your fusion is. So probably you all heard about ITER, the big uh, global experiment, and Fusion for Energy, which is the European organization uh, for the procurement of all the ITER components. So uh, I always, to the layman, say that Fusion for Energy is the organization which converts European money into stainless steel and concrete, and they are actually building big devices. And then we have Eurofusion, which is a consortium of 30 national research centers in 28 different countries, and behind that there's about 150 universities. So for Poland, the uh, research center we are working with is IPPLM in Warsaw, and Roman is the head of the Polish research unit, but behind IPPLM there's the various universities, Opole University, Wroclaw, Krakow, etc., etc., which all can participate in the fusion work via IPPLM. Our goal is to achieve fusion electricity somewhere in this century and as soon as possible. Um, and to get there, we have drafted the roadmap. And the roadmap is a document where we have based ourselves on a number of, of uh, technical documents. We have made assessments. And from that, we have tried to derive what is the best way, how can we get as fast as possible to um, uh, to, to uh, fusion electricity. And we try to avoid open-ended R&D. So we try to not fund any R&D which uh, doesn't bring us more fast to the solution. Of course, we have backup solutions because we don't know, uh, we're doing research. You don't know whether everything, what we are doing works. So you need to have some fallback solutions. The original roadmap was drafted by my predecessor, Francesco Romanelli, and his team in 2012. Um, we have been using that for many years now. And last year, we published an updated version that was needed because the ITER schedule was changed. Uh, we had different views with regard to demo. We had some good results. Wendell Stein has come in operation uh, according to plan, uh, I would say according to the more recent plans. Um, and uh, also uh, some of the scientific findings were very positive. So the roadmap is really a, a, a goal-driven program which uh, aims to get electricity and it brings in all the different facets of the work. So the science, physics mainly, but also engineering technology, but also increasingly we have to think about uh, industry. And uh, our roadmap is event-driven. So we really, because it's, it's very difficult to set up a roadmap if you don't know the budget. And for instance, at the moment, we still need to wait what budget we will have for the next European framework. If that is more than we, we think we have or we hope we have, then we can do things faster. But if it's less, then automatically things take a longer time. Um, very important for the roadmap is that ITER should be a success. ITER is really a very big investment for all of the world and we need to make uh, ITER a success. And uh, additionally, we need to have a credible path towards DEMO. And DEMO is the first plant which uh, delivers electricity. Uh, we need to think already a little bit behind them all, but we don't want to get a machine which, which gives electricity very fast, but then we cannot extrapolate it to a reactor. So we have to think about getting there. We need backup strategies, I mentioned that already, and we use this to prioritize research. So this is the roadmap. I divided it in short term, which is pretty much Horizon Europe, so that's the period until 2027 medium term and long term. And the goal is the fusion power plant. And um, actually, when I show this to the ITER team, they're sometimes a little bit disappointed. They say, well, ITER is, is at this moment the, uh, the most important device. We need to make it a success. But ITER is not all. ITER is not the final solution. For that, we need another device, which is DEMO, because we need to show that we can generate fusion electricity. So you can see, I don't have a timeline at my roadmap uh, because it's event driven, but uh, of course you can convert it in times. Uh, the first plasma and ITER is in December uh, 2025. 
and the full performance phase starts in 2035. And the, the time scale is linear. So this gives you a little bit of setting. Now, to make ITER and DEMO a success, we're doing a lot of research on present-day devices, and I will spend quite some time in showing you some results uh, which we're doing that. So these are tokamaks we have, plasma-facing uh, component devices. In principle, also the Stellarator, but the Stellarator, we have a separate line. Then, for DEMO, we need to develop materials, we're working on that, but we need to develop materials which uh, go beyond the materials we have for ITER. We need materials which can withstand um, a lot of displacements per atom. So typically in ITER, each atom in the plasma facing components is displaced on average one time during the full operational lifetime. In DEMO, we will go up to about 100 times. At this moment, we don't have yet these materials. We're working on it. But we need also to test them with a 14 MeV neutron source. And so this is uh, why we need a device called IFMIF Donus. Donus is demo-oriented neutron source. It's a 14 MeV neutron source. And then the Stellarator, uh, it's our, our long-term uh, backup. Um, uh, so the Tokamak uh, has a number of issues. Uh, it drives a lot of current in the, uh, there's a lot of current driven in the Tokamak, which causes uh, events like disruptions. We have edge localized modes. A Stellarator doesn't have that. A Stellarator is also um, a steady state. Uh, so a Stellarator has a number of advantages, but uh, as you will see, it's also a much more complicated device technically. So for the moment, it's still a long-term backup, but maybe ultimately it's the solution. And then of course, we want to uh, do fusion as cheap as possible. It, it should be affordable for the people so we need to, uh, to work on concept improvements to in, and innovations. Now, people always say, can you already work on demo before ITER is uh, operational? And well, this graph is clearly not for you to read, uh, but it just shows that we gave some thinking. This is the ITER schedule from 2025, first plasma operation until 2040. This is demo from 2014 to 2060. And you can see that in each time uh, during the ITER operation, we feed information into the demo design. So we can already work on the design of demo because many elements we know. But there's some elements we don't know and we just need to make sure that at the proper time in the design, we feed this information in. Of course, you see also here a uh, risk that if ITER is delayed for whatever reason, this information comes available at a later time, it will automatically have an effect on demo. Um, now, the roadmap missions, I will go quickly through this because otherwise we, we are only doing this slide for the rest of my talk. So, um, the eight challenges of the roadmap are we need to create the high performance regimes uh, of operation. And uh, important there is to work with metal walls uh, because metals uh, have a number of advantages above carbon. You don't have tritium retention, you don't have dust formation. And uh, so we're working very hard on that. We have to work on the heat exhaust because in the diverter of the tokamak, so at the bottom of the tokamak, the typical heat loads are 10 to 20 megawatt per square meter steady state. This is the flux you have at the surface of the sun. So you need to develop materials which you can lay on the sun and which basically stay there forever without melting. Of course, we have the advantage we can actively cool but we are working also on, on different configurations like the Snowflake, the Super X, and we have special test devices to test what happens with materials under these big loads. Then the neutron resistant materials already mentioned, so we are working now together with Japan on IFMIF Donas in Rokashu. We're working on new materials like tungsten fiber composites or, or these are copper chrome zirconium cooling pipes with, with tungsten to um, ba basically give a better bonding. Then the tritium. We need to provide a tritium because this is the world supply of tritium. It's about 20 kilograms. What is known commercially, maybe there's more in military, but this is what we know commercially. Uh, when ITO comes in operation, it quickly goes down. And this means that we need to provide our own tritium. So we need to 
develop breeding blankets, and we are working on that, and we are going to test them in ITER. Uh, then safety and demo have taken together because we want to already work on a demo design where we really also try to uh, uh, look into the integration issues. System engineering is here the best word. You really want to optimize the whole system. Then the uh, uh, cost of electricity where we are working on additive manufacturing, high-T superconductors, virtual engineering, many, many things to make fusion cheaper. And ultimately, the Stellarator, um, you can see here already that technically it's, it's uh, quite a challenging device, uh, superconducting coils, uh, but uh, the machine, Wendell Stein 7 x is, is working better than uh, what everyone had, uh, could, could dream of, I would say. Uh, so this is really brilliant. I drafted the top three rats because they are uh, within your fusion organized in our ITER physics department because also the Stellarator is more, uh, let's say, physics oriented, whereas the blue ones are more in the uh, demo department. So let me now take you through. I take mission one and two together because they're very much coupled and I need also to watch a little bit my time. Um, so, um, the challenge here is um, to work with these devices. So JAT is still our flagship device. It's the largest operating tokamak in the world, and it will be for, uh, well, at least until the middle of next year, because then GT60 will come in operation. GT60 is a little larger than JAT, but uh, GT60 uh, still has a carbon wall. It cannot work with deuterium tritium, and it doesn't have remote handling. So, for that sense, JET will stay until ITER comes in operation, the most ITER-like uh, machine. We have a number of devices which we call the medium-sized Tokamak Aztex Upgrade, uh, TCV in Switzerland, and MAST Upgrade will come in operation later this year, but the physics campaign starts in January next year. And then ultimately, of course, uh, ITER. Um, well, here you can see how complicated it is because as your fusion, we run all these devices. We coordinate all the researchers going to the devices. This shows JET. GT60 comes in operation next year. Then the three medium-sized devices. Wendell Stein I have here is uh, now in shutdown for two years, but then WEST is seen as a plasma-facing component device, but also the linear devices. So all the green bars are, let's say, operational phases where we are trying to send researchers to the various labs. Sometimes I feel we are like a travel agency coordinating all the researchers to do research. But of course, the real aim is to do science. So mission one and two. The challenge is to get manageable, minimal disruptions uh, because demo, actually, we don't have any disruptions at all. We need to go to a scenario without ELMS. ELMS is the edge localized mode. Uh, so for the non-fusion people, compare it with a solar flare at the edge of your tokamak, which then deposits a lot of uh, heat in your diverter. So you need to control that. We need to control the exhaust. We need to detach the plasma from the diverter and, and keep that control. And we need to, uh, to meet the needs for ITER and, and demo, which means uh, long enough pulse length, uh, et cetera. And uh, we should be able to, to extrapolate what we're doing. We, we should be able to understand it. it. It's great to make a high performance, but if you cannot model it, then it's very difficult to predict what ITER will do. So over the next decade, we are looking into uh, a coordinated experimental and theory program. Uh, we are studying advanced diverters. I will come back to that and also test the ITER uh, plasma facing components. Here you can see in, in uh, JET, the gray dots are the uh, data with the old carbon wall. Um, uh, remember in 1997, we had 16 megawatt of fusion power in JET. Uh, this was with a carbon machine. This was still with a much larger plasma volume um, and um, with a much higher plasma current of seven mega amp. Uh, we are now slowly getting back there. So the red data were the best we had in 2016. We just came in operation in June, and we aim now to get back in this goal, which is compatible with the 15, 16 megawatt of fusion power. 
In Aztecs, we are working on a no ELM regime. So we are using, uh, making uh, H modes and we try to, to get no ELMs. This is a uh, test of the I mode. And also from Aztecs is um, operation as steady state. So where you really try to non-inductively dry, uh, drive the plasma current. So very nice results there. Uh, then uh, we do disruption management. Again, a result from Aztecs where you can see two discharges uh, which are going down. They reach an area where disruption starts to develop. The red uh, discharge disrupts. And with the blue one, you actually use, uh, I think it was with uh, electron, cycl yeah, electron cycloton current drive, you use electron cycloton current drive to get back into, let's say, a safe mode. So here you can see how you can try to avoid a disruption from, from happening. So very nice experiments. At JAD, we are using uh, adaptive uh, predictors uh, from, from scratch. So we, we try to set up models which make it possible to uh, train, uh, let's say, a disruption detector. And at, at JET, we basically have a success rate of 96.6%, and about 1% of the disruptions goes missed. It's still a little bit large, but uh, we, we try to do good here. And we have tried the, uh, the network also on GT60SU, uh, the, the old GT60, there we had a success rate of 94.7, so just looking back in the old data. But at least we, we are getting there, we are getting better and better uh, in our neural net networks and artificial intelligent techniques to, to try to uh, predict disruptions. Elm suppression, we are working on that uh, too. So here you can see um, uh, the black dots are Elmi uh, H modes. Uh, but you can see the, the purple and, and green data, uh, they um, basically have no elms. And so we, we are doing, uh, um, making progress here, and, and the key ingredient is here the triangularity of the plasma. Uh, so we, we get more and more feeling how we can get rid of elms, how we can avoid disruptions, but we're not yet there. Let us now look shortly at JET. Uh, JET, of course, is a unique device because it's the only device in the world with a beryllium wall and a tungsten diverter, so the same as ITER. It's the only device which can operate with tritium, so next year we are planning first a full tritium campaign, only tritium, 100%, and then after that we do deuterium de 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 tritium. Uh, we have remote handling and in performance it's also the, the closest. And so, as I said, uh, we are looking into that. We are also looking into the disruption isotope effects, et cetera. And, well, this is the best discharge we ever had in JAD, uh, if you look at the performance. So it's 16 megawatt uh, for basically a second. I, I think probably David Campbell was around in the control room when, when this was uh, done, as that time he was working at JAD. Um, and uh, we also had something like four, four and a half megawatt uh, during five seconds. Our target for uh, next year is to get 15 megawatt, but for five seconds. We cannot go longer because that's the time duration of our neutral beam. So uh, basically it's, it's uh, and we are well on our way, uh, but we have to work on the beams there. Also, uh, you can see that already now we're doing a lot of work for ITER, so we installed a shattered pellet injector. This is a collaboration with ITER, but also with the US, with uh, DOE and Oak Ridge, uh, CCV, and here you can see a photograph of the very first pellet. And I think the next slide, uh, maybe you can start it from there. Uh, this is a little movie um, where you can see the pellet coming in somewhere here. So a shattered uh, pallet is, there it is, um, it's actually uh, a, 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 a frozen piece of hydrogen which we shoot into the uh, plasma, but just before we shoot it in, we, we let the pallet go through a sharp bend. It breaks down in many pieces. And the idea is that you crank up the density in the plasma volume a lot, and then the idea is that runaway electrons are uh, uh, stopped by this density. Um, 
At JAP, we are also uh, doing tests for ITER, the DT fusion power measurement. So uh, we, we have been calibrating all the neutron diagnostics. So JET has quite a number of them. And we um, tested, you know, here you can see, we had a neutron source at the end of our remote handling boom. And the remote handling boom can go uh, really uh, 360 degrees uh, through the uh, machine. Uh, we needed nine days uh, to, uh, to calibrate, and the calibration was uh, precise within 6%, and this was a very nice test for, for ITER. Okay, then on the exhaust, uh, as I said, we need to get ultimately in demo order two gigawatts of power out of the plasma, means that uh, 400 megawatts will go to the surfaces of the machine, uh, we have, and uh, many people don't realize, in demo, the wall loads can be much lower than an ITER. ITER can have relatively thick plasma-facing components. Demo will have very thin ones because the idea is that the neutrons shouldn't, uh, let's say, be stopped in the plasma-facing components. They should penetrate through and they should lose their energy in the blanket where they, uh, uh, let's say, deposit heat, but where they also create a tritium. Um, and also the diverter area is very small, so we need to work on highly radiative uh, plasmas where most of the energy is, is distributed kind of uniformly. And we also need to work on the diverter geometry. So at the moment we are testing snowflakes, we are doing that in TCV in Switzerland. The Super X, uh, which we are doing in, um, in MAST. And double null will be tested in Aztec. So basically, you can see that each of these options gives you an enlargement of your strike point, and in that way, uh, you know, you spread the heat over a larger surface. Additionally, we're having plasma facing component test devices like uh, Magnum PSI, superconducting linear device in the Netherlands. Uh, West, for the time being, is used as a plasma facing component test facility with a tungsten diverter. Uh, Ulig has uh, uh, Judith, the uh, electron beam facility, QSPA in Kharkov, and this is Ulig PSI also in, in Ulig. And here you can see some recent results from Magnum PSI where they exposed uh, uh, tungsten, uh, ether, ether grade tungsten. Uh, they exposed it under a power flux of 20 megawatt per uh, square meter, which is in the high side. They did that for 18 and a half hours continuously, so it's not pulsed, but really continuously. And in that, they mimicked one full continuous full power, power year, uh, year of operation of, of ITER. And the good news for ITER is that the uh, tungsten uh, at the end was still okay. So um, very good news. We, we saw some blackening. It depends a little bit whether you use helium or not, uh, but uh, it's, it's really very good news. Uh, we're working on uh, tritium removal and retention techniques. This is work which is done in, uh, in Ulig. Uh, so we have these uh, facilities to, to try to get the tritium out and to look at the retention in the materials. Um, these are some recent upgrades we are funding, double null in ASDAX, the Super X in MAST. Uh, in TCV, we are installing baffles. We have high T superconductors which make the flexibility in the snowflake diverter larger, actively cool diverter in West, and in uh, Ulig we are combining the linear device with the electron beam device so that you have more freedom in, in tailoring your experiment. Our Italian friends are working on a complete new device, which is also jet size or even a little bit bigger. It's a superconducting device to test diverters. So as soon as we in Eurofusion know what kind of diverter we want to use, uh, we will uh, basically ask uh, Italy to, to put it in. We are going to fund that, of course. And uh, our friends from uh, Prague, they're working now on Compass upgrades. Compass will be closed uh, in about a year from now. And uh, Compass upgrade is a high field device, is a copper device, but with five Tesla on axis. And possibly we are going to test their liquid metal diverter. Okay, let's go to mission three, the materials. Um, so we have to get materials which don't embrittle, uh, which have a suitable operating temperature, 
we need to think both of the structural materials but also the functional materials we use for diagnostics and heating devices. We have to take into account the decay heat, we have to uh, 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 take into account the waste. And well, basically our standard materials we have now for, for demo are Eurofer 97, which is a, a, a steel alloy, uh, which is pretty good, but has a limited temperature range. So that's for the structural material, tungsten for high heat flux components, and copper chrome zirconium as cooling material. We use materials test reactors uh, for now. You can do a lot of testing with, with fission reactors because the 14 MeV neutrons you only see at the plasma facing components. Uh, as soon as you go further into the, uh, the wall, the neutrons have a downshifted energy spectrum. Um, and so we need a device which is called IFMIF Donus. I think I might have a figure of that, but, but here you can see some of the materials. So here you can see um, actually, this came up as an idea when uh, people um, from Fusion visited the textile uh, industry just for fun. You know, you sometimes have these social trips. And then they were wondering whether you can also make these wires with, with tungsten. And so that was possible. And then this tungsten is casted in the copper chrome zirconium. And you get a very uh, strong structure. Actually, the fractured toughness has been improved. And also similarly with the uh, tungsten fiber composites. Here you can see uh, two uh, movies. I don't know whether these were, we didn't test them. Maybe you can click on the left movie. Yes, it works. This is the standard tungsten. So tungsten is extremely brittle and it breaks immediately when you put pressure. And now you can click on the other one. And this is a new form of tungsten. It's developed by one of the Eurofusion engineering grantees. It's severely cold rolled and ultra fine grain tungsten with a little bit of potassium in. And you see the tungsten now gets very ductile and not brittle at all. Of course, this still needs to be done, uh, put in a reactor and see whether it still works, but it's a great breakthrough. Um, uh, we're testing uh, all these um, uh, components also. This is uh, work in Gladys where we tested the various uh, manufacturing techniques and uh, most of them, they, they uh, are intact. So it's working. Um, this is uh, work we did for, for the heating and current drive for ECRH. We need um, uh, diamond windows. So these are diamonds of uh, 18 centimeters diameter two millimeters thick, and we can use them for, for heating. We still need to optimize them a little, uh, but at least it's also an enormous step forward. Then we need to have our neutron source. So the idea is to have a uh, de deuterium injector. You shoot uh, deuterium ions with 40 MeV energy onto a uh, lithium uh, surface. It is a liquid lithium target, very much like a waterfall, a lithium fall actually. And then you generate here also the uh, 14 MeV neutrons, very much like in a fusion reaction. And we are testing now this device in um, uh, Japan, in Rokashu. This is uh, being developed as part of the broader approach. So you can see all the flags. Uh, so Spain, Italy, France, um, uh, I think Germany and uh, um, uh, Japan itself have been contributing. And we are now working on the design of Donas. Uh, we already selected a site for Donas, uh, which is in, uh, uh, well, not in, but very close to Granada in Spain. And the idea is that in two years from now, we, we would like to go for a decision on the construction. Uh, also work in, uh, um, uh, let's say, other countries like Croatia has been working on this dual beam facility where you have um, uh, helium ions with one MeV and uh, uh, heavy ions. So the heavy ions actually mimic the neutron irradiation. And so you can look at the combined effect of, let's say, damage and um, helium. And uh, well, this was just inaugurated in June. Uh, it's a very nice facility. Then demo itself. Um, a demo, uh, we, we, we didn't, uh, many people think we decided on a concept. No, we are doing an engineering study to see where are the integration issues because uh, designing a device like demo is not very easy. 
And the question is also, should demo be close to ITER or should, uh, and, and further away from a first of a kind, FOAK, and then the fusion power plant, or should demo be a little bit further away from ITER and then establish somewhat smaller? So we're looking at all these issues. We, we need to have a, a plasma with a highly uh, radia a high, a high radiative plasma. Uh, we need to think about breeding blankets, uh, about uh, the plasma facing components, um, uh, containment, uh, balance of etc. Basically all these aspects we need to integrate. We are working already with industry, together with Framatom, um, the former Arriva. We have been working already on the plant layout. And um, we are working on the breeding blankets together with FRE and ITER. We are thinking about the activation, uh, remote handling. Remote handling is very important because the maintenance in a fusion reactor should be optimized. Because the main driver ultimately for a reactor is the time uh, the reactor is available and each time you need a blanket module if that takes you a few months downtime it's very bad so you need to shift uh, for instance change the vertical set on a Monday morning rather than uh, on, on uh, let's say the month of March um, so we are now trying to to go a little bit down uh, make some selections very soon in the gate review and the idea is in the mid-20s um, we uh, get to, uh, let's say, a baseline solution. Uh, we are now going through a number of gate reviews uh, where all the work packages, uh, they are being reviewed by external panels. And somewhere in the uh, fall of next year, we have what we call a, a gate review. So an external panel will then look critically at all the work which has been done for demo and we need so now and then to make some choice so there could be some work where we say well okay we don't believe this ever will make it into demo we completely stop funding this work there could be work where we say well it has prospects but it's more difficult and maybe we don't take it in the baseline but we still keep funding uh, it in a low level uh, so in this way we want to make a, a well documented decision here you can see the plant layout, uh, which already uh, showed a, a cross section through the building. And um, well, this, this shows you very much the uh, demonstration power plant. Everyone who has seen, uh, let's say, a similar graph of ITER will see that it's quite similar. The main difference is the two cooling towers here. And of course, we have the turbine building because we have to extract the heat and uh, either use the heat uh, or turn it into electricity. So this is what you won't see in ITER. But you see the Tokamak hall, you see the assembly hall, you see the additional heating, diagnostics, etc. It's all there. Then on the cost of electricity, um, uh, we are working on many different uh, things. We try to improve also on the design cycle because very often if you make changes in your design, it's a very lengthy process. And we try to, to work uh, here also on, on things like virtual engineering. And uh, at the moment, our uh, high, so we're operating a 10 petaflop uh, uh, high performance computer, Marconi Fusion in Italy. It's now roughly used for 10, 15% for virtual engineering. So engineers which really go into the computer and engineer components and test them in the computer rather than in a laboratory. So you don't build it anymore, you first test it and then later you build it. We're working on the remote handling we are looking into uh, high-T superconductors. Um, we don't think that we necessarily need to go to a much higher field, as some groups in the world uh, think. You go to a higher field and much more compact, uh, compact tokamaks. But we think the gain is mainly in the fact that the cryogenic cooling uh, will go uh, down. Um, and, uh, of course, the, the additive manufacturing and things like that. And then the Stellarator, that's very much my last mission, and then I'm, I'm more or less near the end. Um, something went wrong here with the, with the text. Um, so the challenge, well, basically the, the, um, the good thing I mentioned that already, uh, Stellarator doesn't have disruptions. It's a steady state divide. Uh, it's technically a little bit uh, more complicated. But still, we think it's, it's very useful to keep the Stellarator open for a long time. And we are also doing in Eurofusion some 
uh, very specific power plant studies for the stellarators. So we're not repeating all the work we're doing for demo. We are not looking in breeding blankets specifically for stellarator because they will be quite similar. But we are looking in things like uh, the remote handling. Can we take out with this complex geometry the, re the, the, the blanket modules, etc.? Uh, the beauty of a stellarator is that the field is completely external, so you can measure the magnetic field lines uh, with just an electron gun and a fluorescent rod, as was done in 2015. Um, and uh, already, uh, I think in the second operational campaign, Wendell Stein achieved a world record for the highest triple product for stellarators, I should say. Uh, but this is uh, uh, a very nice result, and, and, and uh, really it shows that the machine really has been built to perfection. Apart from all this, we are getting already involved in ITER, so we're gearing up now uh, to test the first ITER component. So neutral beam test facility in Padua is a kind of prototype of the neutral beams for, for ITER. Uh, we're going to send from 2020 onwards uh, 20 people there. Um, and uh, so we, we have a call there, so for young scientists which can work in the team and the deadline for that call is late July. We are also training the future generation, so we have um, the researcher grants and the engineering grants. And the deadline for the researcher grants is the end of the week, so if you want to apply you need to hurry up. Uh, for the engineering grants it's uh, the 6th of September. Um, Important is also that Fusion gives spin-offs, uh, since there's also people from outside here. Uh, so a very nice spin-off is, um, let's say, uh, Brucker, who worked together with KIT in, in Germany on the uh, superconducting cables for ITER. They uh, got a number of patents. And with these patents, they now uh, are leading the world mar market in medical resonance imaging. And the turnover, I've been recently told, is even one and a half to two billion per year. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have been working with a small company uh, doing explosive forming. We were trying to qualify that company for ITER. And uh, as a result, they uh, now are making the cockpit of the uh, Airbus A380 with explosive techniques. So it's also a very nice um, uh, example, uh, palladium alloy membranes, which are using a jet for, let's say, filtering out the tritium. Uh, they're now using car industry and also remote handling. We find many applications now outside fusion. So in summary, um, we uh, have the roadmap, which is a very comprehensive uh, research plan, which tries to convert hopes of people uh, into predictions and designs. Uh, we have a, a quite extensive plasma physics program to help ITER succeed and to, to guide the demo design. Uh, we have a reference demo uh, which, which helps us to resolve integrating issues and, and interfacing. And um, uh, this, this, show, uh, this also makes it possible to very rapidly uh, jump on other designs if, if they uh, turn out to be more fruitful. We have some backup programs, uh, alternatives, and the aim is to, to uh, get to fusion electricity as soon as possible. And, uh, well, that's basically it. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this excellent ov overview of the fusion program in Europe. And now we have time for questions. Have some questions? Yes, please. Uh, which uh, kind of uh, which they propose to be between, between ITER and DEMO? Um, I've seen the plans. Uh, what you are thinking about it? Well, CVTR is, you could say, is, is a kind of Chinese demo, and CVTR is a, um, a kind of, uh, well, similar to a device which in Europe we call Flexi Demo. So you start with a device which um, uh, has a, a capital Q of two, so in principle the performance is lower than that of ITER, but the aim is to have already, uh, let's say, full tritium breeding. And then in a second phase, they want to exchange the blanket and go to uh, performance which is similar than the European demo. 
And I, I think that's a rather big step. Uh, we are working closely with, uh, with uh, China, so we have some work. We had already two workshops, demo CFETR workshops. Um, there will be another one in Karlsruhe in February, March next year. So we are exchanging their ideas. Um, I think in some, uh, some areas, the plans of China are uh, a little bit optimistic. Uh, maybe in some parts a little naive that we think we uh, uh, there, 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 there's some uh, parts of design, but they move very fast. So they got a budget now for a five-year design phase. They are uh, going to build uh, the CFETR design center, which will host 800 people. Um, that will be in Hefei. If you compare that in Europe, our budget for demo is kind of similar as the CVTR budget, maybe even higher, but the Chinese salaries are much lower. Uh, we have a central demo design team of 30 people, and then most of the money is spent in the laboratory. So on our side, the coordination is much more difficult. So it would be ideal to also have a central demo design team in Europe, but for the time being, that, that would be impossible. Uh, so, we, we follow CFDR very closely and, and we even are discussing now in how far we sh should jump on, on board. And with China, and I understand that um, other, other parties have a kind of similar feeling that we have to be careful with the in intellectual property because at the moment there's a lot of stream of intellectual property towards uh, China. And uh, we need to be careful that we basically, at the end, lose all our knowledge and at the end we build a fusion reactor, uh, buy them from China in, in 30, 40 years. Uh, I, I know that in the US there's similar feelings. I know how it's, I don't know how it is in Japan, but... Uh, so we are, uh, we are uh, very eager to collaborate, but it should be of mutual benefit. And, and so we're working on that. Thank you very much. Do we have more questions? Please, David. Start of operation. No, thank you. If you get the if you get the construction permission for if Smith Dawn is, what is the time scale foreseen for its operation? Uh, the the uh, total building time will be in the order of um, uh, seven to eight years. Um, uh, critical, actually on the critical path are the results with the uh, LIPAC, the, the IFMEF IFIDA, which is in Rokashu. At the moment we are um, uh, conditioning and commissioning the, the deuterium beam. Uh, we need to understand, we need to optimize that and have a good feeling that we are on the good path. Because we need to have the results before we start procuring the, uh, the accelerator for, for donors. But in principle, the idea is to have a decision uh, early 2021 to build it. The site has already been selected. And um, Spain is very keen to, to work on it. Uh, FRE has requested the budget. Uh, so in principle, it looks all uh, relatively positive. But uh, yeah, we need to see. But uh, let's say seven, eight years. So the first uh, irradiations could start before 2030. Thank you. And the last question from Martin. Um, there's an uh, incredible progress in the different uh, strategies for ITER and DEMO uh, with M suppression, disruption, mitigation, scenario development, and etc. However, sometimes I have a feeling that this goes not all together. So what's the Eurofusion strategy to bring this to the, into the integrated scenario for ITER and DEMO to have uh, L mitigation, disruption, mitigation, good performance? Well, this, the, 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 well the, this is a very good point, uh, because, uh, for instance, uh, recently um, uh, our, our friends from Dublin 3 in the US, uh, they published the SH mode, the Super H mode, with even a better performance. Uh, but they didn't publish anything on, on how the elms look like and what is the disruptivity of these modes and how sensitive, because it's a very narrow operating space. Uh, so, yeah, we, we're looking in all these different aspects and we have to put them together. So, at the end, we, we try to understand the different features. So, very important uh, for your fusion is also the theoretical modeling that we try to understand what we're doing. And from there to get to a kind of integrated view. Because at the end, you need to have really for demo a plasma scenario which, which basically is solid, rock solid. 
And uh, so this, this is uh, still a very important step we need to do. And for that reason, we are putting more and more emphasis now on, on theory. So we, we started a new initiative, eTask, uh, which maybe in the first phase of Eurofusion fell a little bit out uh, because all the theory support was for relatively short-term activities. We're now going to fund uh, activities which can take five to seven years. So people really developing a new model, they get funding to work on that for, for some time. And uh, so the idea is that uh, this will help, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's extremely important what you say. And we, we need to work on that and put all the efforts on trying to integrate these different pieces of the plasma in one single uh, uh, fusion or tokamak simulator. So, thank you very much. So, let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you.